Hello, and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here at Black Hat. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Savannah Peter, my co-host. Savannah, great to see you. Awesome Pleasure segment coming here. up. Jackie McGuire is here, senior security strategist at Cribble. The company that's been growing super fast. We've been covering it for a long time. Jackie, great to have you on theCUBE. Great to be here. Thanks, Thanks for coming for on. Oh, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. So a lot going on. Savannah and I were just talking off camera with you about your story. Let's start there. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, wait, I want to dive in there a little and tee her up, John, just because it's a really compelling story. You come from money for tech companies and research. Yeah. And you end up selecting Cribble, which I think is rad. But you were doing research in this space when mm -hmm. you became acquainted with them, right? Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, so I started my career accidentally in finance. Uh, didn't know what a mutual fund was and applied for the wrong job at Fidelity. And turns out I applied <laughs> to be a stockbroker. <laughs> Thought I was applying to process payroll. Um, so I did that, became a registered investment Love that advisor. You just got it and ran with it. Though. Yeah, I Go mean, you know, you'd be surprised with like 72 hours in an internet connection how much you can BS an interview. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so I became a registered investment advisor um, and moved over to Silicon Valley Bank and did that for CFOs for a while. Um, and then I, I wanted to do something different. Uh, so I found UC Berkeley had a data science boot camp, and I thought, you know, People who can actually explain data are kind of hard to find. And one of the things that I had found was one of my strengths in my career was being able to explain things. So I did the data science boot camp, uh, built this machine learning model that could judge a book by its cover. Uh, and a data scientist at Adlumen, which is a sim, just happened to see it and reached out and said, hey, I'm looking for kind of our first algorithm hire. Uh, would you be interested? And that's how I got. How long got, ago was this? This is 2018. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that gives me like shivers. You just went for it. That's not even that long ago. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, everything in life is risk management, right? Every decision you make is risk management to hopefully stay alive. So um, going from finance to security, while there's a lot of terminology and things like that to understand, it's all kind of the same game. It's, you know, how do we manage our risk? How do we get more out of every dollar we're spending? That kind of thing. So. It was, a, it was a leap, but I, I love it. And I have to say that security is the industry I found where I can be the most myself of any industry oh, I've yes. worked in, which love is that. always nice, because I'm a little neuro spicy, so. You are <laughs> sitting next to some neuro heat right here. Yeah. So I love that. <laughs> I, I, I'm here for it. So I, I want to step back, because that's so cool. So you, you when we're big fans, we go to Women in Data Science WIDS every year, and it's, it's very passionate for us. So I love that you've learned this skill. Ladies, if you're listening, it's not too late to learn data science. Yes. Anyone listening, it's not too yes. late, just for the record. But you're such a great example of it. Okay, so you go and learn. You're the first algorithm hire, which is rad in yeah. itself. Judging books by their cover, quite literally. Also super <laughs> cool, I'm into that. Talk to me about the journey from then in, in 2018 to finding Cribble, because I know you were on the research side as well. Yeah, so um, working at the sim, you know, I, I found out that I'm a pretty okay data scientist. Um, but a lot of the time I spent as a data scientist was just trying to wrangle data. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to write all these cool algorithms. And it was more like the first three months was a text file of syslog and sysmon and just trying to regex it into a JSON dictionary. So um, when I was looking oh, wow. for a change yeah. kind of coming out of the pandemic, I posted on LinkedIn like, hey, what do I do? I have all this different experience. I really like security. Um, and one of my husband's good friends who he played rugby with, Justin Lamb from 451 Research, S&P, reached out to me and said, hey, you would make a great research analyst. Um, so I did that, which is how I met Cribble. And when I met Cribble, <laughs> I was like, you mean I don't have to use regex anymore? And that was literally like, it, as soon as they said, hey, we can do the regex for you or get you 90% of the way there, I was like, sold. Because that it's such a pain, data wrangling is one of the most painful parts of being a data scientist. Um, and just looking at the toolkit Cribble had, um, and kind of the direction that things were going in terms of data volume and you know needs, I was like, this company is doing something different. Um, and being vendor agnostic also really resonated with me. I'm a big open source proponent. <clears throat> I think if you look at what our adversaries are doing, they open source everything, they work together, there's no barriers to entry, there's no licenses. Um, no governance. And, yeah, no side. governance. Fire everything. Also that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also so that. Coming, yeah. coming okay. from finance, a little bit of governance would be good. But, um, no, but really, if you think about it, like it's if you want to beat your enemies, right, art of war, you have to think like your enemies. And so uh, I was really uh, impressed with their commitment to staying open source, or staying vendor agnostic, working with everybody, open sourcing some of the products that they had. Um, yeah. And, when they reached out, it wasn't wasn't a tough decision. I do, I do miss being a research analyst, but uh, this is fantastic. So you saw Cribble, basically, because they came in from more of that 
observability side because mm -hmm. where their roots were. But you saw them as a bigger opportunity. Oh yeah. And you mentioned the adversaries. You know, they're they're just all in. They don't. They don't need governments to just fire everything. And the world has gotten more complex. One of the big conversations we have in theCUBE is complexity is getting more, it's more complex every day and the data volume's growing. So yeah. you've got complexity in, 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 in platforms yeah. and tools and more massive data volume. Yeah. So this is, a, it's a, this is a field day for the hackers, I mean, for the bad guys. And Cribble, what does Cribble do to solve that? Because that's a big, big part of the, the theme I've been seeing with Cribble. What's the update on that? Because every enterprise is growing exponentially with the data. Yeah. It's not getting less complex. Yeah, so the last figure I saw is data is growing at something like 28% compounded annually, and most security budgets Wow, are, that's a lot, actually. <laughs> it's a lot. That's, yeah, it's doubling that's every couple of years. That's a great data point. Holy yeah, moly, that's and, wild. Yeah, and the first talk I wrote as in this role at Cripple was called Security is a Data Problem. And that's the reason that, without trying, half of Cripple's users were using Cripple for security when I met the company, is that we hit our ability to generate data um, has completely outstripped our ability to make sense of it. And so if you think about 15 years ago, uh, if any of you were in the enterprise then, I'm dating we were, myself. We were all, yeah. Don't worry, you're sitting up here with us. The Q's been around something. for 15 years, so we were yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we're here. I think <laughs> you were lucky to have maybe a desktop at your office, and, and if you were super fancy, you had a Blackberry connected to the internet, right? And now mm -hmm. if you think about the number of things in the enterprise that are connected to the internet, all of which need to be monitored, because if you lock a door, a hacker's going to climb through a window. You know, we have hackers coming in through the automation systems for air conditioning. If you look at the target breach, we have oh, wow. every, and so the, the number of things you need to monitor has exploded, the number of, um, and then the, the amount of time you have to hold that data. So one of the other interesting things we're seeing is dwell time has tripled in the last 10 years. And so hackers are being very patient, right? They'll get into your systems and they'll wait for 18 months, two years, wow. as long as it takes. So the amount of data you have to retain has also really exploded um, and regulatory uh, requirements are only gonna make that worse. Yeah, so what really impressed me is that Cribble was building this kind of Swiss army knife for data, this kind of, um, and it was really a, a user-led development approach where it's a product built by users for users, and they were looking at, okay, now which part, of, where can we remove friction in the data process? Yeah. Um, and that's really what it's all about is, you know, how do you make better quality data and remove friction so that the data is where you need it, when you need What's it? What's the core problem that Cribble solved? Because originally it was data volume, move it around, getting things set up, wrangle it. Is there another problem that you guys are eyeing that you see that you solve that companies are seeing that's a little bit broader. Well, can you be can you share us the update on the problem that the customers have? Yeah, we solve a number of problems. I think the initial problem that Cribble was solving was how do you get, get data from where it is to where it needs to go in the format that it needs to be in. And so one of the, as an economist, one of the things that you've seen in the last 25 years is venture capital and private equity fueled this proprietary platform explosion where they didn't want to invest in anything that wasn't you know, defensible with IP. 100% so these weird silo their own, channels. Yeah, yeah, so it was almost this like venture capital fueled silo farm. Um, totally. And so the first, call the first problem we really solved was kind of get that data in, process it, and get it where it needs to go, and only the pieces of it that need to get there. Um, and now we've moved uh, more towards uh, storage and discovery because that's, that's really the next problem that we see. So we launched Cribble Lake, which is a managed lake product that literally within a, a minute you can spin up a lake without having to put a ticket into IT. For, a minute? Yeah, yeah. That's it's, impressive. Yeah, and all of the identity wow. and access management go, uh, pushes down from Cribble Cloud, so it, it really rem <laughs> removes a huge hurdle to s establishing object storage. Yeah. Um, and then Cribble Search, which is our federated search product where you can go out, search data at rest where it is, and then only pay to pull back results. Because one of the really inhibitive things when you're trying to respond to an incident is if you've got to pull eight terabytes of data in to find 24 kilobytes of data, it's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Um, so Cribble Search was the other like, hey, let's figure out how we make searching more efficient. How do we search multiple clouds? Um, yeah, and there's, we have a lot. Um, and then I think if I think about where I think we're going, um, We've developed a lot of really great uh, tools for our customers, and now we need to help them prioritize how to use them, right? So somebody hands you a Swiss Army knife, and it's like, great, but which piece do I use first? How do I figure out where we're at? How do I figure out where we're going? Yeah. 
And that kind of guidance is, I think, um, where we're going. Yeah, I want to get into the, uh, how does an organization implement Definitely. this problems because we just had our SuperCloud 7 event in our studio last week, and one of the things that came out, it's interesting how the conversations and data changes. The hottest conversations are open table formats, mm -hmm. governance and cataloging, because the data mm -hmm. is being separated from, from the compute and the database. And that's a whole other conversation. What's the role of the database? But we want to go there. <laughs> Open table formats, cataloging, and then intelligent applications mm -hmm. with Gen of AI that'll be native to the apps, which is coming. So that means every company wants to modernize. They have yeah. to figure out, okay, how do I get a, a comprehensive, scalable data strategy that yeah. enables the apps? Yeah. And that seems to be kind of the high level boardroom that's dictated down to the platform engineers and the data science teams. Yeah. The analytics teams and then, so how do you guys walk into that environment with Cribble and say, okay, look, we're here to modernize you. Yeah. Because okay, we got a tool, does this, yeah. but I you have a bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, um, what's we the, don't say that. And well, then, <laughs> they, well, they do, well, they, yeah. well, they do. Because <laughs> here, I, you know, so one thing is I, I like, I'm a people washer, right? Okay. So I've been observing for a couple of years. And one thing vendors do is they walk into a customer and they say, you know, you really ought to be driving a Ferrari. And we sell all of the parts you need to build a Ferrari, so just buy all the parts and then build a Ferrari. And the customer's looking at them like, that would be great, but I'm driving a 98 Corolla that I inherited from like seven different people, and I have to swap parts out as we're driving, and if it breaks down or I have to pull over, I lose my job. And so, those people don't work here anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a great yeah, analogy, nobody, honestly. You know, and yeah. so, what I said is I was like, well, let's help customers segment data into like the different stages of collection and processing and all of that. And then let's give them uh, what I call a maturity model to assess where they're at, because that's really what you need to do. You know, being a financial advisor during the uh, financial crisis was all about helping people continue to make progress and continue to make good decisions, even when they're scared, even when there's so much information that you confidence. can't absorb at all. Confidence in the chaos is yeah. essentially what you're providing. Yeah, and if you don't give people the best first step, they'll do nothing because there's a hundred steps and thinking it's about all of them is just, yeah, you shut down. And so that's what we help customers do. You know, we help them look at where are the different piece, places there are friction in your enterprise and where are the different stages of data, movement, processing, storage, where there's low hanging fruit or there's really mm -hmm. obvious need for, you know, improvement, whether it's, you know, data collection, are you using a hundred yeah. different agents that are all manual, you have no fleet management, whether it's storage, you know, are you basically making a choice, either we're going to store it in our SIM or we're not going to collect it mm -hmm. at all, which we see a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so really helping customers figure out where do I start and then how do I, how do I keep progressing? So how, how do they know they're on the right track? That's where the maturity model comes in. So um, my colleague Ed Bailey and I developed this, um, what we call a data maturity model, which mm -hmm. essentially shows you kind of what are, the, what are the signs of being in each stage of maturity. And that way you can say, okay, I'm not trying to get from no visibility to everything's AI powered and automatic. I'm trying to get from no visibility to some visibility. And so kind of breaking it down into steps, not just a beginning and a destination. And then you get to feel that progress yes. too, because it can be a pretty overwhelming journey, I would imagine. Yeah, because what I, what I found in finance was that when people make decisions when they're scared or they feel like they're being reactive, even if they make the right decision, they don't feel good about it. So if you can help people feel like they're being more proactive and you help them instead of saying, hey, your SIM is really expensive, say, hey, you spent good money on this SIM because it does a lot of really good things. Let's give it the best data we can. That's, that helps people feel better about the decisions they're making and feel more proactive. And ultimately, they'll continue to make better decisions. You mentioned open source before. You, you mentioned open source before. <laughs> I want to get your thoughts on um, cu customers some, sometimes have the right intentions. They want to do the right thing. But they get stuck in the mud and they kind of hit a wall. Yeah. Have, and based on your observation, what, what are some of the reasons why is that? Because sometimes it's either they think they're just doing things, they're spinning their wheels, but it's not actionable. It's not moving the needle. What, what, when, where do people get stuck? And, and what's the needed to kind of get them on track to your question? Yeah, I think um, I see a few things. One is that um, when you talk about terms like observability and security and things like that, uh, on the vendor side, we put you know, these different things in very neat boxes. On the enterprise side, a lot of things like observability isn't a job, it's a set of things that have been fragmented across like 50 different people in an organization. And security is very similar, and so I think one of the places you find friction is competing priorities or competing interests. And so 
there's often a failure to align the department or team initiatives with the initiatives of the group as a whole and then the initiatives at the executive level. So I really find that um, you know, helping take a step back and say, okay, how does this project tie to the next step layer up and the next layer up? Um, being neurospicy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I uh, love that term. It's not always natural for super technical people to understand explaining things at a much higher level, right? A lot of times I love to data dump. So I'll come in and be like, let me tell you about JSON. Let me tell and, you about one of these details. Let's yeah, get into it. Let me tell you yeah. about Cribble's best pipelines <laughs> and exactly what they do. No, but you know, like one of the best analogies I use for Cribble all the time is we're kind of like commercial plumbing for data. So rather than just having like one shutoff valve for your whole house, we give you controls everywhere data starts or meets other Each data or stops. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if your toilet leaks, you don't turn yeah. all of your water off. Um, and that's being able to come up with analogies, um, higher level strategic messaging. Uh, those are the tools that we find that users and technical champions really need to be able to advance projects with higher level sponsors, their executive sponsor, uh, board of directors, if it's a huge initiative. It's a lot about communication is what I'm hearing. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned this, the, uh, the plumbing, commercial plumbing. If you think about the data trends, it's been data science, dashboarding, analytics, mm -hmm. it's a database industry. Yeah, if, you're yeah. a, if you were a data person, yeah. when I was in the industry and as a data person, it was all about the database. Yep. And mm -hmm. then you had data warehouses, then the cloud cloud data with so Snowflake lakes, and Databricks so and the yeah. lakes. Now you're seeing engineering and real architecture to your point around mm -hmm. thinking about holistically yeah. an organization and saying, this isn't a data scientist coming in and saying, hey, we have a problem. No, this is a platform thinking, mm -hmm. systems thinking. Yeah. So you have data engineering going on and still growing analytics. Yeah. Where, how do you see that rationalized for organizations? Because one, they're growing, some get automated, some don't, mm -hmm. but you have to do that plumbing kind of like, you gotta lay it out, like where does it go? Yeah. Well, the interest, so I think one of the really interesting things right now is we've spent the last 20 years telling people all your data is in silos and that's a bad thing. You got to break the silos down, put all your data together. Well, to your point, now we're starting to see every enterprise that's connected to the internet wants to use generative AI. Well, guess what? Everything that comes out of generative AI has to go in a bomb-proof silo because if your generative AI accidentally eats that for training, it's going to do what's called model collapse, which is a very expensive process by which yeah. your AI gets dumber and dumber and then just stops working. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> it just drives itself into the ground. Yeah, model yeah. Collapse. Through a self learning process, which is even worse. What's it called yeah. again? Uh, it's called model collapse. model collapse. It's essentially a snake eating its own tail. Um, yeah. And there was a really interesting case where this happened with ChatGPT because Quora, the, web, the answer website, used ChatGPT to generate a whole bunch of answers to questions. And they've got baller SEO. So their answers always show up like top they three. Do. Well, guess what? ChatGPT trains on Google results. So if you start training on a whole bunch of answers that you generated, ChatGPT 3.5 had some problems for a couple weeks and they pushed four out to, yeah. to fix that. So um, yeah, I think the, the entire way we think about data in the enterprise has to change. So to me, data is an asset, right? It, it needs to have a value both as an asset and as a liability. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the risk yeah. associated with that data as an asset. And it's difficult because the value of data is dynamic, right? Like, Data from nine months ago might seem worthless until you find out somebody breached you 10 months ago and then all of a sudden it's invaluable. So um, I think we really need to, one, help technical champions be more strategic in their thinking and communication, mm -hmm. understand yeah. strategic thinking, totally um, and then two, help you know, executive level champions, CISOs and CEOs really understand how the whole business benefits from maturing the security function. It's interesting you mentioned about the, the silos, vaulted silos or bomb-proof bomb silos. Also centralization is coming back too, data lakes, right? So <laughs> yeah. centralization and silos, but that could be distributed. So I want to get your thoughts on this because we're seeing um, generative AI, it needs data. Yes. So silos so traditionally to. tend to be <laughs> slow, late, low, or higher latency retrieval. Yeah. So how, how are companies thinking about making data available, but also protected? Because you have to kind of do both, right? You have to kind of, that is the secret to the security paradigm. Because if the generative AI app doesn't get the right data, it doesn't do the right thing. Right. So you have model failure on one side, but also data availability is yeah. the other one. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, and that's, you know, I think we're seeing a lot. <laughs> Originally, the first kind of year of ChatGPT was a little crazy because we had a lot of people putting sensitive data into ChatGPT through their personal accounts. 
Um, so what we're seeing now is a lot of large enterprises are bringing those models in-house, right? So there's a number of different companies who produce proprietary large language models where you can either um, on a periodic basis retrain them from those slow databases or you can do what's called retrieval augmented generation mm -hmm. where you put some of the really key nuggets in a more performant database and then as you kind of ask questions it, it hits that performant database for the stuff that you don't want to have to train on on a regular basis and I think that's what a lot of companies are doing to kind of help that. Um, I also was just reading last night about there's a couple new technologies, uh, Python packages out there to help um, the, sm the small nature of those data pools makes them a little bit more fallible than a really large language model. Um, so helping them make better decisions, helping them prevent from hallucinating. Uh, but yeah, to your point, it's, it's a constant push-pull of how do we give the model enough data that it can give good advice to our employees, but not so much data that someone can accidentally coax a session token out of it, <laughs> well, <laughs> which you, we've seen. Which is a fine line, though. Yeah. 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 No, no, I think really that's a really is. good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the session token is kind of anecdotal. I'm not going to mention which extremely large technology company, but one of their data science teams pushed to a public GitHub a data science model that they had inadvertently put full machine backups in with unhashed session tokens. And so if even the oh largest companies in technology who are building these things are having these problems, Obviously, That's the smaller companies are, are struggling as it's well. It's interesting, all these process problems that, that should be handled. Yeah. And also, this come up a lot in here in the hallways to, in this event. A lot of the systems were built by people who don't even aren't around anymore. So no one even knows what the config files are looking like or the metadata or What's the patches. What's legacy? That's what yeah. you're like, who, who did that? Who runs like, that cluster? Who, yeah. Like, yeah. There's I wrote, a lot of, I wrote detections. Yeah, I wrote detections yeah. for those old core banking servers, the Cobalt ones, that are like in the corner of a credit union where if somebody shuts the wrong light switch off, right. your, your banking app just stops working. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, there's... There's kind of a lack of awareness that we've got all of these legacy technologies that are just piling up and without some strategy for how do we sunset them or how do we mm -hmm. make sure that we have a plan going forward, to your point, there's also a ton of key person risk in technology, yeah. which is a really big focus in finance of like, you know, if this person gets hit Can't by a bus. bus. No, no, it's always the analogy. But they never, yeah. that's, I've never heard key person risk discussed in a security meeting at all, ever. Really? Yeah. That really surprises me yeah. given the level of, I mean, encryption and security and everything that would be going yeah. around any activity there. It doesn't even matter if we're talking about LLM. Yeah. And yeah. it's just crazy to think, you know, that it's just not a wow. thing we think about because we just assume that everything we do is backed up to get, you know, to a Git or something like that. But no, it's just, it's not as There's much a of a focus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, the, it's just the nature of the beast, right? Yeah, like, if yeah. someone's going to be more intimate with that data or that process or whatever, naturally. Wow. I mean, I wow, think if I'm you've worked in that. security long enough, we all know someone who's gotten recruited back to a previous employer because something broke that nobody but that person could fix, like, six yeah. or seven years later. Like, I know three people I can think of off the yeah. top of my head who, in the last two years, have changed jobs because something broke that they built that no one else could fix. And that's... It's just not tenable. It really yeah. not it's with so unsustainable. Not with data growing yeah. at twenty eight percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chen AI, oh maybe to the rescue. Jake, it's been great to have you on the cube. Really appreciate you. Just the final question is, you know, we're seeing the research from our team. Product sprawl still out there. Oh, yeah. um, the, there's still holes to fill, but there's a disciplinary approach to the portfolio of products and risk management. Integration, interoperability is very key. Yep. You guys kind of play that plumbing area you mentioned. So as the products broke will continue. Mm -hmm. There is a platformization rethinking going on. Which, yeah. How do you? How is Cribble solving that problem? What's the What's the Cribble value proposition? End us with a quick plug for Cribble and how you solve all those problems. Yeah. So I wrote a paper probably a year and a half ago on cybersecurity mesh, and I think that's really where we're getting to. Is that you know pipes is not enough any longer. You really need a mesh that interconnects mm -hmm. every system with every other system. And so Cribble is, we're the mesh, right? We're the pipes between all the things that can take the data from where it is to where it needs to be. And so I think as we, um, as we think about things as like having to integrate security into the data science development process, Cribble really is the platform that can take data from one team, format it into formats that several different teams care about individually and send them the right streams of data that they need. 
Um, and unless we are all sharing data within the enterprise the way attackers do, I don't think we're going to solve this problem. So that's what I see as being a, a huge opportunity in the future for us is unlocking the value of people's data. And the results, you guys right. are doing extremely well. You're in the top handful of, of all time growth companies fourth in tech. Fourth largest, fourth fastest growing infrastructure, infrastructure. company in history. <laughs> history. In that's, history. That's huge. Amazing. Well, we knew Clint before he was all famous and everything. Now you guys are doing great. They've been fans for a long you know, time over here. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're OG. He's Rosie followed Rose. the Cube growth, and, and congratulations to you and your team. And, and you. yeah, that's, the scope's yeah, broadening, awesome. and you guys have a huge opportunity. Can yeah, look, look check us it. out. We've got tons of free tools and resources on and our website. And we also have sweet lightsabers that just need a shout out, because they've been on our yeah. swag segments at KipCon, yeah. so. We have the best swag, so yeah. come, yeah. Find, yeah. come find me at our booth, and I will, yeah. I will hook Repeat you up. Repeat winner on the Cube swag segment for Savvy Swag. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Thanks so much for coming on. And <laughs> thank, thank you. And thank you for sponsoring us, and to tell the team we're really appreciative to allow us to do what we do, and thank you so Love much. They're lucky do. to have you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Genuinely, I'm so impressed. I don't say that always sitting here. I'll be honest about that. Okay, Nero <laughs> Spicy here on theCUBE. I'm Sean Furrier, just sitting here, hanging on at theCUBE. <laughs> Thanks for watching, we'll be right back.